intro. So Anand is the team lead of OpenShift GitOps service team at Red Hat. He has around 17 years of experience in building and operating enterprise applications. And yeah, I think uh, we're all excited to hear from you, Anand. Yeah, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Anand Francis, and I'm from the uh, Red Hat Developer Tools team. Uh, I'm here to present a talk on multi-cluster GitOps, uh, mainly dealing with two open source products, Argo CD and open cluster management. So probably Argo CD, many of you might have uh, been familiar with that. Uh, probably quick show of hands, like how many have heard about Argo CD? Yeah, not surprising. It's, it's quite a popular uh, CD tool. Uh, and how about open cluster management? Have any of you tried out or used open cluster management, OCM? OK, I see one hand. Nice. OK. Yeah, uh, probably uh, this was done already. Uh, I'm working as a team lead uh, for one of the managed service that we are building in Red Hat. Uh, it's a CI CD service built on Tekton and uh, Argo CD. So this is a quick agenda on what we'll discuss in this session. We'll see what a multi-cluster setup is, uh, the need for it, and what are the challenges that we have. Next, we look into like what is OCM and how OCM can help. Uh, then we can see what are some of the GitOps principles and what is Argo CD. Then we can see how we can leverage both OCM and Argo CD to build an uh, open application uh, model-based framework. So that will be a demo based on both these uh, open source uh, tools. And yeah, finally, we can uh, have questions. OK, so let's start with a basic cluster. So this is a single Kubernetes cluster. We have a control plane and a data plane. And in control plane, we have storage in HCD, scheduler, controller manager, and API server. And data plane, we can have multiple nodes, and pods are kind of allotted to each node. So this is a single cluster setup. And uh, ultimately, we can have a a cloud provider uh, which provides the load balancer to interface with all these uh, uh, workloads. So now let's get into one more detail. Like I'm adding an another cluster. Uh, so this is a, a two cluster setup, but still you can see that the control plane nodes are kind of segregated. They work in isolation. So this is one um, issue with Kubernetes. Like a cluster is kind of an independent resource. Uh, and the control plane is kind of uh, controlling all the aspects of it. The life cycle of the cluster is controlled by a, that single control plane. So there is no interaction with that. So what we mean by multi-cluster setup is some kind of federation between two or more Kubernetes clusters where we have a control plane that can control more than two clusters. So these are some of the common reasons why we need a multi-cluster. So uh, the broad areas I've just marked here. So one is the location. The next one is the isolation, reliability. And there are some specific scenarios where multi-cluster is the only choice. So let's start looking into each of them. For location, there are like jurisdiction constraints where data has to reside on a particular uh, uh, region or a country. Uh, latency, there can be like cu customers accessing your services across multiple regions from, from the world and the latency can be a factor. And then we have data and service gravity. Like we you have your data residing in part some particular region and you can't move that out. So you need to operate your Kubernetes cluster in the same region or, uh, or your service might be already running in a particular region and you want to run your Kubernetes cluster along with that. We'll look into each of it in detail. I'm just uh, giving a quick overview here. Uh, isolation, though Kubernetes provides uh, isolation through namespaces, it's, it's a weak isolation. So if you need strong isolation, 
You can have scenarios like where you have multiple environments like dev, test, staging, and QA. You can have hard isolations by having multiple clusters. And cost could be a reason where you can like uh, uh, segregate the cost aspect of it from different departments and different uh, uh, parts of your company having different cost controls. Uh, the next can be performance. You can have multiple clusters offering different uh, service level agreements and thereby giving different performance and cost uh, benefit of it. Uh, the last one is the security of it. Like you can run your audit services and security related services in a secure isolated cluster uh, which is not exposed to the other parts of the uh, workload. And then you, the, the, the last reason is the organization. You can have an organization-specific uh, multi-cluster so that uh, uh, each part of the organization does not interfere with the other uh, part of the organization. Next, related to reliability, uh, we have infrastructure diversity. Like you can have multiple clouds, uh, multiple regions uh, to increase the reliability of the service. So for example, if one AZ goes down, you can have multiple AZs, I mean clusters running in multiple AZs and regions to take care of the uh, infrastructure, uh, reducing the blast radius. So if uh, one of the workloads is down, like you can reduce the blast radius by operating it on multiple uh, regions and multiple clusters. Uh, next one is to handle upgrades. So whenever you are upgrading your Kubernetes version, you can have multiple clusters and like slowly move your workloads to the new version. Last one is uh, scaling. So if your uh, Kubernetes has reached uh, a scaling point, like where you have to increase the number of nodes, and uh, that the number of nodes are kind of a limiting factor for a single cluster, you can have multiple clusters to kind of scale your workloads and move on to different uh, clusters. Yeah, so the specific scenarios is like some complex migration scenarios where you have to migrate to a different CNI, uh, you need a different cluster altogether to move to a different uh, CNI versions. And then there are some edge and IoT use cases. Uh, now the, we are going towards MicroShift and K3S where uh, Kubernetes is being run on a Raspberry Pi kind of a device. So there it can be like each device can be uh, treated as a Kubernetes cluster in itself. And there we can use this multi-cluster scenario to kind of control the overall flow. So a, a bit more detail on the same aspect, like one is the jurisdiction, like where customers are forced to run all their data centers in a particular region or a country. Uh, next one is uh, controlling the latency. So if there are customers working in, I mean, accessing your service in different regions, you can have different load balancers and you can point to the right load balancer based on the customer's region. Uh, this is related to data gravity and service gravity. For example, some of the data that your workload requires is already available in one of the regions, and the cost of egress of that data would be expensive, so you are forced to run your Kubernetes cluster in those regions. So this is one example, and this is related to service. Similar to data, if you are depending on some particular service, regional service, and you are not able to move that service, you can use the multi-cluster approach to handle that. Yeah, and uh, these are like performance related, like you can have different uh, uh, customer tires uh, where you can have different uh, SLAs, you can offer different SLAs for different uh, customers. Uh, this is the environment that we already spoke out. We can have the dev functional, uh, different environments on each cluster. Uh, organization, like during mergers and acquisition, like there can be different organization that are kind of integrated, and uh, you don't want uh, different parts of the organizations to kind of uh, interact with each other. In that case, you can have different uh, clusters for each organization, and there could be like uh, cost control reasons where each organizations want a separate bill, so they don't want to uh, share the bill, and they can have cost control on their usage. And infrastructure diversity, uh, so you can uh, like use different flavors of uh, Kubernetes cluster to uh, have a diverse uh, infrastructure, which is uh, which can help in uh, increasing the reliability of your workloads. 
reducing the blast radius. For example, if one of the cluster goes down, there will be still one healthy cluster that will still serve the request from the customers. Uh, these are cluster upgrades, so when you want to upgrade a cluster across different versions, you can use this multi-cluster and kind of move your workloads to the uh, newer uh, clusters. Yeah, so uh, Edge IoT, that's, uh, that's an uh, upcoming area where uh, Kubernetes is being run on like smaller devices, and uh, you can use this multi-cluster approach to kind of uh, handle the fleet management of those clusters. And this is like an example of uh, a CNI migration where, where you need a completely different cluster with a different uh, CNI provider that is installed. And you want to kind of slowly move your workloads to the new, uh, new, newer cluster. Yeah, so now let's look at the challenges we have. Um, the first one is the infrastructure cost. So as, as you scale more clusters, the number of control planes is going to increase, and uh, the cost of administering uh, the cl cluster also will increase. So the infrastructure cost is going to go up. Uh, the next is the complex configuration, so you have to plan well in advance, especially the network configurations, how each cluster networking should look like, and uh, how you kind of uh, configure each of the cluster, so the RBAC, and other related parameters that needs to be configured for each cluster needs to be done in an efficient way. So this is a challenge right now. And security aspects, same, like oh, we have to configure RBAC and we have to ensure that all the security certificates are kind of handled efficiently. And the inter-API calls between these clusters also needs to be handled. So OCM or the Open Cluster Management handles some part of these challenges. Uh, infrastructure cost is not something that can be addressed with the OCM tool, but configurations and security aspects of it can be handled using OCM. So now let's look into what, what OCM is. So Open Cluster Management, or OCM in short, is a community-driven open source project. It's in a CNCF sandbox maturity level as of now. Uh, it's based on a hub and spoke architecture. So we have a central admin server and several managed clusters that are uh, attached to that. Uh, it, it supports multi-cluster and multi-cloud management. It can provide uh, fleet management, so you can handle all the configurations with a single pane of view. So all, all the configurations are done in a single uh, place that gets replicated to all the managed clusters. So it's highly scalable, basically due to the pool-based model that, that it uses. So the admin server just acts as a storage layer, and all the managed clusters does the, most of the effort in pulling those configurations towards the managed cluster. So we have a uh, CLI uh, interface, which is called Cluster ADM. That, that eases the management and creation of the uh, resources. So this is what is briefly about the OCM. Uh, this is uh, the architecture of it. So we have a central hub cluster, uh, which, acts as a, uh, which acts as the control plane of all the uh, Kubernetes clusters that are going to be connected to it. And then we have multiple managed clusters uh, each each uh, managed clusters will have several agents that are running on it, and uh, the hub cluster will have a placement controller and a registration controller. So the registration agent and the registration controller is is the one that is involved in the uh, initial regist uh, initial uh, uh, registration of the managed cluster with the hub cluster, and the work agent is what. It, it picks the work from the hub cluster and executes it on the managed clusters and then sends the status back to the hub cluster. So the main advantage is you can manage the fleet and also you can uh, have a single place where you can configure all the resources uh, through the hub cluster. So this is the typical cluster registration process that we have. Um, so 
hub cluster and the managed cluster are kind of isolated. So there can be like two different administrators for them. Uh, the hub cluster will provide a token and that token will be used by the managed cluster to do the initial registration. Then it creates a CSR, certificate signing request. Uh, that initiates the registration process and the hub cluster has to accept that uh, the managed cluster in order to uh, accept that signing request to create the managed cluster setup. Once the cluster is uh, integrated to the hub cluster, it keeps sending the heartbeat to, in to indicate that uh, it, uh, the services are running healthy. And uh, whenever the certificates are kind of expired, the uh, Hub cluster will trigger uh, and it will issue a new certificate for the managed cluster. So this is the uh, hub and spoke model. So here you can see that the admin cluster does not have any uh, workloads as such. Uh, it, it, it has a namespace for each cluster and it assigns work for the managed clusters as, a, as the workload unit. Uh, whereas the managed cluster is a typical one, it has nodes and it has pods assigned to it. Uh, it has the work agent that continuously pulls the hub cluster for any new work that is being created in the hub cluster. It will take and execute that on the managed cluster. So these are uh, some of the concepts uh, in the OCM. So we have a managed cluster. Uh, that's the cluster that we are going to uh, uh, th that is going to host the workloads. Uh, hub cluster is one that is used purely for the management of the cluster purpose. Uh, and then you can group the clusters. The managed clusters can be grouped as cluster set. So you can group it on certain parameters, like you can group your uh, cluster set based on the environment or the cloud provider that is being used. So there are different combinations that can be used. So the, you, you can see the label selector, claim selector, and similar to Kubernetes, taints and tolerations, you can have taints applied to the uh, managed cluster as well. Uh, placement is another uh, resource type, custom resource type, uh, that can define like what are the managed cluster that, that needs to be selected. Uh, and placement decision is the output. So whenever you are sh scheduling um, a workload, you create a placement and you associate a managed cluster set to it. Then the placement decision will select a, a, a subgroup of the clusters from the managed cluster and all the workloads will be spread across those clusters. Manifest work and manifest work replica set. These are the work related items. So the workloads get spread using these two aspects. So manifest work replica set works on, I mean it's, uh, Manifest work works on a per cluster basis. Manifest work replica set will work on a cluster set basis. So that is the essential difference. But both are uh, used to spread the workload across the managed cluster. So th these are some snapshots that I've um, uh, taken. Uh, so this is how a CRD for a managed cluster will look like. Uh, this is the below one is the managed cluster set. You can have different uh, label selectors to select all the uh, managed clusters that match a particular label. Uh, then you have an exclusive cluster set label, which, is, which works on a uh, label that is specific for cluster set. So uh, that particular label can be set only for one managed cluster set. Uh, next, we have placement. So this is uh, used for the selection criteria. So you can select based on a label uh, or a claim selector. So claim, claims are uh, uh, properties uh, which are assigned to the managed cluster. For example, you can set uh, the platform. Uh, for example, if it's AWS, you can set the platform.opencluster.management.io. Uh, which, which uh, mainly says that what provider is that particular Kubernetes cluster is. Uh, you can uh, also have uh, a prioritizer policy. So predicates are like filtering criteria. The clusters are get, get filtered based on the predicate criteria. You can also have the prioritizer policy where you don't want to filter, but you want to say the top 10 
clusters that match this particular uh, cluster criteria. So you can select based on uh, how much CPU and how much memory is available. And you can tell the number of clusters that you need to select based on this particular criteria. So this is an example of a manifest work. So this is how the uh, workloads get spread across the uh, multiple clusters. So here you tell uh, the namespace. So each managed cluster will have a particular namespace created in the hub cluster. So a manifest work will, uh, will work only for a single managed cluster. So here you have to tell what kind of workload you want to deploy on your managed cluster. So this is how you have to uh, kind of specify that using the workload manifest. So here I'm creating a deployment uh, on the managed cluster. I can uh, create this on a target namespace and that particular cluster will pick this workload and deploy it. Um, Next, we have a manifest work replica set. This is uh, an um, extension to the manifest work, uh, and it's still in an alpha state. So this is a new feature that got developed. Uh, so here, the advantage is you can uh, refer a placement, which can uh, select uh, any number of clusters. So this is spread across all the clusters that match this placement uh, name app platform clusters. So uh, in this example, I'm using uh, the Argo CD application to deploy uh, uh, a guest, guest book application, which is a sample application. Uh, we can see an example of this uh, in the demo as well. Okay, so now uh, the OCM concepts are uh, like almost complete. Now I'll get into the GitOps aspect of it. So. This is a standard uh, GitOps principles that we have. Uh, we have a system that is described declaratively, and Kubernetes is a declarative system, so we can manage uh, the uh, artifacts and the workloads that, that need to run in Kubernetes. Uh, the desired state is versioned and stored in Git. So this is uh, one of the principles that uh, the uh, storage should be versioned and the desired state must be explicitly set uh, in Git. So all the workflows that, uh, that is applicable in Git, like uh, all the approval and PR process can be applied, and approved changes are applied automatically through an agent. And there is continuous reconciliation uh, in GitOps, like where you, you have a controller running in the um, Kubernetes cluster, which constantly pulls the changes that are happening in uh, in the uh, Git repository, and it constantly checks for differences and corrects the uh, required and makes the required changes to keep it in sync with what is applied in uh, Git. So, a little bit about Argo CD. So, Argo CD is a, um, a CNCF graduated project. Uh, it follows all the GitOps principle. Uh, apart from Argo CD, we have Flux CD as well. So both of these uh, uh, projects are kind of uh, achieving the same GitOps principles. Um, uh, Argo CD was created by uh, engineers from Intuit, and uh, they have open sourced the project. Uh, right now, uh, Red Hat also contributes to most of the uh, features and bug issues in Argo CD. So in this demo, I'm using uh, Argo CD to store the workloads that needs to be distributed uh, in, across the managed cluster. So on the left side, you can see the hub cluster where you have different managed clusters grouped as into a single managed cluster set. And then we have created a placement and a manifest replica set to spread the workloads uh, to the uh, clusters that are selected by a particular placement. Towards my right, uh, this uh, has uh, all the managed clusters. So like I have three managed clusters uh, and I have Argo CD instances running on each of them. Uh, I have an application set which, which builds an um, OEM based platform and as part of this demo. Uh, application set are like a group of applications. So in this example, it has a group of uh, Helm charts that installs uh, a bunch of uh, CNCF graduated projects that can be used as a app platform. 
And an application set controller in turn will create uh, several applications. Uh, like each uh, each one will be a separate Helm chart in itself. And uh, the application controller, again from Argo City, is, is what it does the constant reconciliation. So any manual changes that you do to the uh, managed cluster will be automatically uh, fixed and reverted uh, through the application controller. So let's uh, see the recording of the demo. So here I'm creating, uh, this is the cluster admin CLI that I'm using. So I'm creating a cluster set uh, called app platform and I'm adding uh, clusters one and two to that uh, particular cluster set. Uh, I need to bind that uh, cluster set to a particular namespace. This is to control uh, like who can uh, associate a workload to, uh, to that particular managed cluster. So we use RBAC for controlling that and that's why we have to bind it to a particular namespace. So these are some of the commands that are available. I can list the cluster sets and what are the clusters that are selected for that particular cluster set. So the first problem is to apply the, um, install the Argo CD instances on the managed cluster. So the first step is to create a work replica set to install Argo CD. So with this, uh, the workload for Argo CD, Argo CD gets installed in all the managed clusters. So this will be my first step. Uh, and, and the subsequent steps, I will create the uh, application set uh, and spread it across all the um, workloads. So I'm just... Uh, so there are some issues that uh, I was debugging as part of the video, so I'm just skipping them. So the uh, placement reference was wrong, so that's why it was initially not spreading the workloads. So once I corrected that, you can see that uh, the Argo CD ports, they are starting to initialize. So the next step is to uh, apply the app platform, which is the application set that I uh, initially briefed about. So that will create um, uh, the workloads uh, to create the application set and in turn the applications uh, get created using Argo CD. So here you can see all the applications that the Argo CD instance has created. So it, in, it is initially in out of sync state and uh, uh, it shows the health status. So uh, Argo City is, um, has two concepts. One is the uh, application sync and another is the health check. So uh, out of sync means that the required resources are not created yet. So it will keep on trying, retrying in a loop to bring it to sync. So it will create the required Kubernetes resources to bring it to sync. And uh, the health check is for uh, denoting the health of the deployed resources. So all of that is available in a single uh, pane of glass. Like you can see all the uh, components that are getting installed and whether it's in sync and whether the, it's in a healthy state. Yeah, so that's all I have for the demo. Yeah, so I have one more video, but I'm skipping it uh, in, to save time. Uh, that talks about how to... Uh, add managed clusters to the hub cluster. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll skip that for now. Uh, I'm open to questions if there are any. So uh, all the code uh, that I have uh, demoed here is available in my GitHub account. It's, uh, it's a public repository. So if you want to have a look at it, uh, you can take a note of it and use that. Hi. So my doubt is, let's say I have managed clusters in three uh, different uh, cloud providers. GKS, EKS, and everything. I am controlling it with OCM. Okay. So can I create a deployment file? So yes. such as that where each pod will be placed on each uh, cloud provider. Correct. So uh, no, um, uh, 
yeah if i am understanding your question like you have a deployment uh, and you want to spread the pods across, across different the, uh, cloud th that's not, not possible. possible you can have deployments on each of it but probably you can control the uh, replica of each of it based on like if you want one replica in each okay. uh, i mean each environment you can control that part of it, okay. it it's it's not like uh, uh, because the deployment controller is uh, running uh, inside the specific cluster, right? Mm. So OCM doesn't understand what's running within the cluster. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your presentation. So initial slide, I could see you have connected, you know, two different cult clusters with uh, one load balancer. So can you please uh, explain how the connectivity will be? Because as far as my understanding, how the one load balancer will connect to another load balancer? Yeah. Uh, Basically, this is kind of a low, uh, global load balancer concept, uh, wherein you can uh, take a client request and based on the uh, geographical area, you can redirect it to one another IP address. So this, this is based on that concept. Okay, if I have a multiple application in the, mm. I have a multiple deployment in the cluster one and I have a multiple deployment in the cluster tool, uh, how this load balancer will route it to the correct application? Uh, you, you want to route it based on the endpoints? Yeah, since I have a multiple deployment, right? Each uh, application I pointed to, uh, through ingress, I have pointed to an ALB, imagine okay. in such way. How this will uh, route my packets when I have a multi-load balancer concept? So is it about this particular example? Yeah. So in this, this is like all the workloads will be kind of replicated and the idea here is to reduce the latency. So, for example, a customer uh, accessing your uh, a particular uh, application from U.S. region might require to be connecting to the uh, service that is running in U.S., right? He doesn't want to connect to a cluster that is running in India. So, based on the particular region, we can route, it, route the request to uh, the cluster running in U.S. So, that latency will be reduced. But the workload will be kind of replicated in both the clusters. So, it's okay. to serve different customers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think in the interest of time, we'll have the Q and A offline. You can reach out to Anand anytime. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to request money to. Hey, one second.